Many of the problems which face governments nowadays are international ones. Take traffic, for example. All the major cities of the world are having to try to find ways of dealing with too many vehicles and the congested roads which they cause. A large number of the vehicles which clog our cities are private cars. Motorists are very reluctant to leave their precious cars behind and go to work on public transport, despite the constant traffic jams. They regard buses, trams, and trains as being for other people, while they themselves like to drive from door to door. Thus, our roads are chock a block with traffic. Of course, parking space is not always available. Some firms provide car parks or garages, where at least some of their employees can leave their cars. Most people, however, have to rely on public car parks, often multi story ones, or else try to park in the street. Since this is usually highly restricted, with many parking meters in evidence, parking is a source of frustration to many motorists. People who are otherwise quite law abiding are apt to take a bit of a risk when it comes to traffic offences. Thus, they ignore both signs that say no parking. And lines painted down the edge of the road, which indicate parking restrictions. Should they be away from their cars for longer than the amount of time allowed by the parking meter, they are not worried until they see that the traffic warden has left a parking ticket on their windscreen and realize that they will have to pay a fine. The authorities in more and more cities are trying to keep cars out of the city centre. With this aim, they have pedestrianised large areas and introduced park and ride schemes so that people will leave their cars at the city boundary and complete their journey by bus. Still, there are fears that ever increasing traffic. Will cause gridlock in cities, particularly at rush hours. With so many tailbacks and bottlenecks on so many roads, motoring is no longer a pleasure. Why then do so many of us persist in using our cars? Bullying. Education is a very important part of a child's life, and yet an increasing number of children are showing reluctance to attend school. It is not that they find the work too difficult, or are afraid of the teachers. No, it's because they are being bullied. School bullies can make other children's lives a misery. And their bullying takes different forms. Often, they will use their physical size to intimidate those who are smaller and weaker than themselves. They will threaten their victims with a beating if they don't do as they say. Often, using physical force to extort money, and will steal possessions from them by force. Bullies use verbal abuse as well as physical abuse on their victims. The butt of this abuse may often simply be slightly different in some way from the rest of the class. A child may have red hair, wear spectacles, not have the latest fashion in shoes, have only one parent, 
or be of a different race, for example. This can make them a target for the school bully, who will indulge in the most insulting name-calling. Some psychologists say that the desire of the class bully to dominate the others is a result of an inferiority complex or some personal unhappiness. But this does not help those who are on the receiving end of the abuse. So great is the bullying problem that many schools have been forced to draw up an official strategy for dealing with it. Teachers encourage the victims of bullying to report the matter to one of them. But many of them are afraid to do so for fear of more physical assault or more taunts. The bullies will accuse them of telling tales and make them suffer more. Furthermore, those who browbeat others, although domineering, can often appear to be charming to those who are in authority. Because it's so difficult to get victims to report bullies, and often difficult to prove coercion, many bullies escape unpunished. We must protect our children from this persecution. They have a right to enjoy their school days. Parental Aspirations Educational qualifications are considered to be very important in the modern world. They are essential for people who want to find reasonably well-paid employment in the professions. For this reason, most parents try to get their children to work hard at school and achieve academic success by doing well in exams. Many parental aspirations also include their children going to university and graduating with a good degree. Not all children, however, are capable of achieving academic success. This does not matter as long as parents are willing to accept this. But it is quite common for parents to think that all their children have to do is to study hard and they will pass the exams. All too often, they just succeed in causing too much stress in their offspring, with the result that the children either get ill or fail exams that they might otherwise have passed. There are some children who are quite bright, but who are simply not interested in formal learning. Some might be of an artistic bent and wish to become an artist or designer, while some might have a talent for acting. Others may show an aptitude for working with their hands or want to start their own businesses and become entrepreneurs. It is perfectly possible for children to achieve such ambitions. However, their parents may well have other ideas which can lead to family conflict. Strangely enough, many parents are often reluctant to allow children to follow in their footsteps. For example, actors may not wish their children to have a career in the theatre because of the uncertainty of the profession. Business people may feel that their children will have more status in an academic profession than in the world of commerce. The opposite situation also arises. Parents who have worked hard to establish a business may want their children to become part of it, only to find that their sons and daughters prefer to look for completely different occupations. Each generation has different ideas, making communication between the two extremely difficult. Thus has arisen the aptly named 
generation gap. New research on computer games. A Japanese professor has produced evidence to show that computer games can have a bad effect on children. Many parents and grandparents have been saying this for years, but they were largely ignored, being regarded as technophobes. Parental worries about computer games often relate to their effect on their children's health and on their social skills. They feel that they should be outside getting exercise and enjoying the fresh air while playing with their friends. Since many of them usually play by themselves, they live rather isolated lives, with little opportunity to interact with other people. As a result, they may be very poor at communication. Parents are also worried in case the violence of many of the games will cause their children to become more aggressive and violent themselves. This anxiety also applies to television, which often shows scenes of extreme brutality. There are fears too that the popularity of computer games has added to the dumbing down of the information and material used by today's generation. Because children often choose to play computer games instead of reading or doing their homework, the games are thought to have a bad effect on their education. Parents are also worried that video games will prevent their children from developing their creativity. If they spend all their time in front of a screen, instead of drawing, writing stories, and so forth. Professor Ryuta Kawashima of Tohoku University shares parental concerns about the bad effects of computer games. But for different and considerably more scientific reasons. Using state of the art technology, he has conducted research which he believes. Shows that computer games may stunt the development of children's brains. He has been able to show, by means of brain scans, that playing computer games stimulates activity in only part of the player's brains, the part associated with vision and movement. The frontal lobes of their brains, associated with learning, memory, Emotion and self control are remaining underdeveloped. If the children's ability to control their behavior is being underdeveloped, then they are more likely to become violent. Unfortunately, Professor Kawashima's research appears to indicate that parental fears about computer games are justified. Healthy eating. Most of us would like to live a long and healthy life. Increasingly, doctors are telling us that in order to do so, we must eat a healthy diet. Too often, we ignore the advice. In most countries of the developed world, there is no shortage of food. But their inhabitants could be suffering from a form of malnutrition. This is something that we are accustomed to associate with poor countries, which regularly suffer from famine, caused by primitive agricultural methods and overpopulation. The problem in the developed countries is that all too many of us are eating food. Which is far from being nutritious, and which is lacking in many of the vitamins essential to health. Because of our busy way of life, we rely too much on convenience foods, not taking the time to prepare a nourishing meal for ourselves. 
Instead, we grab something from the supermarket shelves or freezer and put it in the microwave. Even when we decide to eat in a restaurant, many of us decide that we have very little time and that our food must be served instantly. It is for this reason that there are, in many countries, so many restaurants that specialize in serving fast food. Unfortunately, much of this food is also junk food. And even more unfortunately, many children have become addicted to this, refusing to eat healthier alternatives. In general, we are eating too much processed food and not enough whole food. Ideally, we should eat more cereal products in order to increase our intake of fiber since there is some evidence that this reduces the risk of certain cancers. Antioxidants, too, are thought to have some effect in preventing cancer, and these are found in significant quantities in fruit and vegetables. Formerly, it was considered important to eat plenty of eggs and dairy products to remain healthy. Such foods are now known to be high in cholesterol, which can be a contributory factor in heart disease. Fashions in healthy eating may have changed, but the message remains the same. Watch what you eat. The Benefits of Chocolate most of us have a sweet tooth, and a favourite form of confectionery is chocolate. Whether this comes in the form of sweets, chocolate bars or cakes. The huge range of chocolate products on display in sweet shops and supermarkets shows us how popular chocolate is. Indeed, some of us are so fond of it that we become chocoholics. We are regularly told that a diet containing too much sugar and too much fat is bad for us. And chocolate contains a great deal of both of these. Thus, we have got used to the idea that eating chocolate is a sinful pleasure. Eating chocolate often makes us feel good. Even some health experts do not deny this because it is thought to have a biochemical effect on the part of the brain that is concerned with pleasure. If you are feeling depressed, some chocolate can be a real tonic which cheers you up instantly. Unfortunately, this effect is transitory and you soon feel down again. Nutritionists have tended to concentrate on the negative side effects of chocolate, pointing out that the combination of a high fat content and a high sugar content can be a cause of obesity in people who overindulge in it. They also remind us that foods which are high in fat can lead to heart disease. Chocolate is also said to cause headaches in some people and is considered to be one of the main triggers of migraine. After such bad news from dietitians, people who love to binge on chocolate will be relieved to hear that some doctors have now discovered some benefits in chocolate. Recent research suggests that chocolate, like aspirin, can delay blood clotting, making it potentially useful in preventing thrombosis. It has also been found that chocolate, like fruit and vegetables, is rich in flavonoids, which help to prevent heart attacks and strokes. At last there is some good news for chocolate eaters. They can enjoy this delicious treat without feeling guilty, safe in the knowledge that it could be improving their health. Endangered Species 
Most of us are now aware of the damage which our modern way of life is doing to the environment. This includes the harm which we are inflicting on many animals. Indeed, we are in danger of wiping out some species if we have not already done so. For millions of years, extinction among animals was a natural process. In fact, it was part of the process of evolution. In recent years, however, the extinction of some species has been the result of human activities. Had it not been for these, many more animals would have survived. Some species have either been made extinct or become endangered because of hunting. Now, even the very earliest of humans were hunters, since they ate the flesh of animals and clothed themselves in their skins. And doubtless their hunting gradually contributed to the extinction of some species. However, it was the introduction of guns with their accurate aim which put certain animals at great risk. And from the 19th century on, several species were on the brink of extinction. By this time, animals were being hunted for commercial purposes, apart from the provision of food and clothing. For example, elephants were being hunted for their ivory. Nowadays, attempts are being made to regulate such wholesale commercial hunting, but it is difficult to control in some areas. Thus, animals continue to die to make profits for humans. Of course, not only commerce is to blame. Hunting as a sport has also played a part in the extinction of certain species. A more modern threat to many animals is the destruction of their environment and the resultant changes in the ecology of whole areas. Our use of pesticides and other chemicals has polluted both soil and water, and this pollution has proved to be toxic to many of the plants which are part of the habitat of many animals. Furthermore, we regularly lay waste to land previously inhabited by animals. In order to make way for expanding populations, or, as in the case of deforestation, to provide goods for wealthy nations. Modern living has had a deleterious effect on the ecosystem. We must try to reverse this to save our wildlife. Modern Celebrities Television and the media are regularly blamed for what is thought to be wrong with modern society. So it comes as no surprise that they are held responsible for today's apparent obsession with celebrities. The strange thing about many of those who are considered to be famous these days is that there is little reason or basis for their fame. Some of them may be film stars, football players or pop stars. Others, though, seem to achieve fame on the grounds, for example, that they are a friend of someone famous, that they wear rather strange flamboyant clothes, or that they behave exceptionally badly in public. Indeed, it is notoriety rather than fame that some so-called celebrities achieve. Of course, other generations have had their icons, but in the past, fame seemed to be based more on talent and was longer lasting. The fame of today's celebrities is often very ephemeral indeed, and they do not remain famous for long. They are in the headlines for a few weeks and then fade from the scene. Compare this with the fame of some of the Hollywood greats, such as James Dean. Many of them remain legends long after their deaths. The celebrities of today 
will do anything to go on appearing in the tabloids. Image is all important to them, and they just love publicity. Often, they claim that they object to the paparazzi taking photographs, but they simply cannot live without the attentions of the media. Once they are in the public eye, they are desperate to stay there. It seems. The worst thing that can happen to them is that attention is paid to someone else. Anything they do is subject to hype. Image makers being employed to ensure that their entire lives are conducted in a blaze of publicity. They seek wealth as well as fame, although most of this is spent on their extravagant lifestyles. If all else fails, they give sensational interviews about being cured of alcohol addiction, drug addiction, or eating disorders. It's sad, but many of today's heroes. Are not very heroic. All kinds of rage. It seems that a great many of us are getting angrier, or at least that we are expressing our anger more. We seem to be flying into a rage all over the place, and rage is now so common. That the English language has acquired several expressions to describe particular forms of it. The first of these rages to be named was road rage. This is used of drivers who are so enraged by other drivers or pedestrians that they let their anger get completely out of control. Often they get out of their cars and shout. And make threatening gestures at the people who have annoyed them. Sometimes they are so beside themselves that they attack the people physically, and there have even been cases where drivers have gone berserk and killed people. It frequently does not take much to provoke drivers who are easily angered. Even overtaking them quite legally can enrage them. Police are sometimes called to people's homes when rage gets out of control. In the worst cases, people who cannot control their tempers become guilty of domestic abuse and beat up their partners. This often leads to the breakup of the family and sometimes to the imprisonment of the violent partner. The supermarket is another place where people get angry. People often get frustrated if they have to queue at the checkouts, sometimes becoming so furious that they are driven to trolley rage. Then they deliberately bang into others with their trolleys, sometimes causing injury. Passengers in planes also sometimes fly off the handle. Known as air rage, this form of anger is usually directed at members of the cabin crew. It is common for passengers who lose their tempers in the air to have taken too much alcohol in the airport bars and to be spoiling for a fight when they board the aircraft. Their violence is dangerous in the air, and they have to be restrained. Try not to let any of this happen to you. Take a deep breath and keep your temper. Gender discrimination. A major American bank is being sued by the U.S. authorities for allegedly discriminating against its female employees. It has been alleged that women in the firm. Do not have as good promotion prospects as the men, and that their salaries are not on a par with those of their male counterparts. Gender discrimination in the workplace is against the law in America, and in many other countries. However, there are still obstacles in many firms which prevent women from achieving the promotion. 
that their talents and qualifications deserve. Many women are promoted quite rapidly through the junior jobs in a firm, but face the glass ceiling when they apply for any of the most senior posts. So it is that although there are many women in middle management positions in many firms, there are very few in top management posts. Many women blame this situation on the old boy network. Others see it as evidence that many men are resistant to change and are still chauvinists at heart, while some may feel that failure to promote women to top jobs is a result of feelings of insecurity in the men who are making the appointments. Perhaps they are afraid of letting women become too powerful. Not many years ago, the power which women have today would have seemed an impossible dream to many women. Before the rise of the women's movement, there were no such things as equal rights or equal opportunities for women. For the most part, women were expected to get married and then be responsible for childcare and for carrying out all the household tasks. If they worked, it was probably in a part-time, often rather menial job. Feminists saw this as sexism and a waste of women's talents and set out to change things. Although some people, women as well as men, now do not have a high regard for feminism, women owe to the feminists many of the improvements in their work situation. Without them, there would be no positive discrimination, no job sharing, and no parity with men in the workplace. Taking time out. More and more young people are choosing to take a gap year between finishing school and starting university. They feel that they want a breathing space between periods of study. Alternatively, they may decide to take a gap year between graduating from university and embarking on a career, feeling the need for some time out before joining the rat race. Most students see the time as an opportunity to travel with backpacking still being popular. The idea of travelling to as many foreign places as possible, staying in hostels or other budget accommodation, appeals greatly. Doubtless, some of them will hitchhike, although hitchhiking can be a dangerous form of travel, especially if students are travelling solo. A large percentage of gap year students have wealthy parents who can easily subsidize their travel. Others have to save up before they go, often taking after school jobs to do so. They are mostly traveling on a shoestring and frequently find that they have to look for some form of employment while traveling in order to make ends meet. For example, they may work on local farms or in local hotels. By doing so, they not only earn some money, but they are likely to meet local people and acquire some understanding of their culture. There are some students who choose to work for the whole of their gap year. A number may decide to get work experience, either at home or abroad, in an area which they hope to make their career, such as medicine or computers. A large proportion of students are now choosing to work with a charity, which arranges voluntary work in various parts of the world. The projects provide hands-on experience of a very varied nature, from teaching to helping build roads or dams. 
The gap year is not just an adventure. Young people can benefit greatly from encountering new and varied experiences, and from communication with a wide range of people. Perhaps most importantly, gap year students have to learn to stand on their own two feet. Computer crime. Computers have become so necessary to modern living that it's difficult to believe that they are a relatively recent invention. Undoubtedly, they have proved to be of great value, but they also have their disadvantages. For one thing, they have added to our already large number of crimes. Hacking. Was the first computer crime that most of us became aware of. By using their computer expertise, people known as hackers can gain unauthorized access to someone else's computer and make use of the data which they find there. They may, for example, get hold of lists of the names of their competitors' clients and use these to build up their own businesses. Or they may use hacking as a form of industrial espionage to find out a rival company's plans. Other hacking activities may be more obviously criminal, in that hackers may log on to financial data in someone else's computer, and either alter it illegally or use it for fraudulent purposes. The possibility of serious financial fraud has been greatly increased by the modern practice of purchasing goods through the internet. Apparently, the use of credit cards to pay for such purchases has led to record levels of fraud, with a great many people being swindled out of a great deal of money. Banks are working hard to improve online security. And to provide safeguards for customers, but fraudsters are working just as hard to improve their crooked techniques. Many computer users worry in case their systems are affected by computer viruses. The people who introduce such bugs into other people's computer programs may not intentionally be committing a crime. But may be doing so as an act of mischief or spite. The motive does not really matter to the people whose data has been deleted or altered, or whose files have been corrupted. Computers are part of a highly technical method of working, in which there are constantly new developments. Unfortunately. There is also a constant stream of new developments in the fraud industry associated with them. All computer users must be on their guard. Stress at work. Statistics show that more and more of us are suffering from stress, and that much of this is caused by our jobs. It appears that many of us are working too hard, and this is taking a toll on our health. There is, experts tell us, simply too much pressure put on many employees these days. In many jobs, in sales or production departments, for example, unrealistic targets are set for the workforce. People are, in fact, trying to do the impossible, and making themselves ill by doing so. In many countries, more and more people are working longer hours. Some workers have to do this to cope with their workload, while others think that staying late will impress the boss so much that he will promote them. This extended presence in the workplace. Is known as presenteeism. Such overwork often results in extreme fatigue or even total exhaustion, 
with many people also suffering from insomnia. When the workers get home, instead of resting or enjoying a leisure pursuit, they simply cannot switch off. Their minds are still full of work worries. Most people used to be able to leave behind the tension and anxiety of the workplace when they went on holiday. Unfortunately, modern communication systems such as mobile phones and email have made this a thing of the past. We find it almost impossible to leave our work behind. Neither the body nor the mind can go on doing too much indefinitely. Workers reach a point beyond which they cannot cope and have to take time off. Some may experience burnout and some may become mentally ill. Meanwhile, a study by some American universities has shown that stress can weaken the immune system. The fact that stress at work leads to illness is supported by findings by the British Health and Safety Executive. These indicate that 60% of absence from work is a result of stress. It is time for us all to take stress seriously and to reconsider the ethos of modern working conditions. Working hard is important, but everyone must realise that even productivity is less important than our health. Bad news. The owner of a company announces its bankruptcy. Thank you all for giving up your Saturday morning to come into the office. My partner, Robert Brown, and I have asked you here today to give you some rather bad news, I'm afraid. We were anxious that you should hear this news directly from us, rather than hear it on the grapevine. Inevitably, it's only a matter of time before it's all over town. To come straight to the point, I have to tell you that the firm of Blair and Brown Limited has gone into receivership. I'm sure many of you are aware of how badly small firms like ourselves have been hit by the recession. We have struggled on as long as we could, but we were forced to accept that the writing was on the wall. Despite various budgetary strategies which included cutting our operating costs to the minimum and uh, having to let several valuable members of staff go, we just do not have enough money to pay our creditors and carry on trading. Some of you may well be wondering why another firm did not buy us. Originally, we hoped that this would be the solution to our problems, but this was not to be. We explored every avenue, but to no avail. At other times, the firm would have been an attractive prospect to prospective buyers, but not now. Because of the recession, many small to medium firms have their backs to the wall and are looking for white knights. It's very much a buyer's market, but there are too few buyers around. Larger companies appear to be conserving their capital and are unwilling to become involved in takeovers or mergers. It goes without saying that we are very sad to have had to come to such a decision and to be leaving you all in such an uncertain position. However, we're simply bowing to the inevitable. What happens from now on will be the responsibility of the official receiver. Someone will be appointed to examine the financial position closely and further efforts will be made to find a buyer. We do hope that these efforts are successful and that your jobs will be safe. 
Thank you all for the loyal service which you've given us over the years. We wish you all the best for the future. Time to study. A principal gives a pep talk to students about how to sit their final exams. I hope that you are all aware of the importance of this year. It's the year when you will take your final exams, and it is therefore make or break year. Some of you have worked hard throughout the years, and what all these students will need to do is to keep up the good work. Some have worked fairly hard, but may have to go the extra mile in order to be sure of passing the exams well. Others among you, and I suspect they are too numerous to mention, have left themselves a mountain to climb. They will have to study very hard and do a great deal of revision if they are going to pass the forthcoming exams. It's important to understand that、uh, if you start working hard now, it's not too late. You must not simply throw in the towel at this stage and think that you have no chance of success. Provided that you are prepared to put your back into it, there is still enough time to get the required amount of work done. However, you must start now. Don't decide to put the whole thing off until tomorrow. You must try to work out a study timetable and stick to it. You also need to make sure that you have peace and quiet to work in. If some of you find it difficult to find the right study conditions at home, perhaps you may have rather noisy younger brothers and sisters. Then we will be happy to let you stay on after the official end of the school day. And provide you with a quiet place to study. I'm not suggesting that you keep your noses to the grindstone all the time. You will need plenty of rest and relaxation if you are to study effectively. However, this is a year for making some social sacrifices. It's time to give up the parties and take up the books. Don't think you can carry on your social life and start studying when you get home. That means that you will burn the midnight oil and be too tired to concentrate either on your home studies or your schoolwork next day. With that, I wish you all a successful year and some excellent exam passes at the end of it. I'll now leave you to the tender mercies of your form teachers. Job losses. A member of senior management tells trade union representatives of company plans. Gentlemen, I have here a memo from our parent company in the United States, which contains important news for us all. The decision has been made to adopt a global policy of rationalisation. As each company is autonomous, we have all been asked. To propose a plan of restructuring, and to send details of this as soon as possible, this will inevitably involve redundancies. But the board of directors here can do nothing to prevent this. Our hands are tied. We have here copies of our plan, and it is hoped, gentlemen, that you will cooperate with us in trying to implement this as effectively and speedily as possible. Obviously. We would wish, where possible, to give people early retirement or voluntary redundancy, rather than impose compulsory redundancy on anyone. You will note that generous redundancy packages have been outlined. We hope that both you and your members will see these redundancies as a way of conserving jobs.
In the present climate, only companies which are prepared to rationalize their workforce will survive. Those who do not will go to the wall. We are confident that if the recommendations are carried out, the company worldwide, and our part of it in particular, will be able to weather the storm. You know how tough the market is just now, and you also know that recently we have had a rather rocky ride in some parts of the country. It is a question of the survival of the fittest, and we must make ourselves fit. This means slimming down our workforce. We appreciate that your members will be concerned to learn of the proposed job cuts, but we hope that they will accept them as being inevitable. If the workers do try to oppose these cuts, they will be on a hiding to nothing. It has been made clear to us that any industrial action or threat of it is likely to put more jobs in jeopardy. We would like to inform your members that the proposed job cuts will apply to all members of staff, to management, office workers, and factory workers alike. Be assured that this is not a case of there being one law for the rich and another for the poor, so to speak. We hope that you will have fruitful negotiations with your members and let us know as soon as possible the outcome of these negotiations. Thank you. Football defeat. A letter describing a local team's poor performance. Dear Jack, I know you like to hear about home news when you're away at college, and so I'm writing to keep you up to speed on the performance of our football team. I know your mother writes frequently, but she's not likely to be interested in the activities of Rowan B United. For most of the season so far, the team's been doing quite well. We've won three games and drawn two. So far, so good. But all this changed on Saturday, when we had an away game against Barrow Green United. I'm not sure that I should tell you the gory details. It's probably best to leave you in blissful ignorance. We were all pinning our hopes on coming away from the game with at least a draw. The more optimistic among us were confident that we would get a result easily, since Barrow Green have not been playing quite as well as usual. To be honest, this was always a bit of a forlorn hope. The optimists seem to be forgetting that whatever their recent performance, Barrow Green are in second place in the league at the moment. They didn't get there without being able to play reasonably well. Still, we all got on the bus to go to Barrow Green full of enthusiasm and optimism and looking forward to victory. Of course, this had something to do with the fact that most of us had taken some Dutch courage with our pub lunch. It would be doing you a kindness to draw a veil over the actual game. It's something that is best not to know about. Our team played appallingly badly as if they had never played together before. In fact, you would have thought that some of the players had never even seen a football before. It was unbelievable. As if this wasn't bad enough, Barrow Green played absolutely brilliantly. Somehow, they had put their recent bad form behind them, especially for us. They left us dead in the water, and we needn't have bothered playing the second half of the match. The whole match was a humiliation for us, and it embarrasses me to write down the score. We lost 5-0. Naturally, we were all gutted, as I'm sure you will be when you read this. Sorry to bring you such bad news. Take care, Terry. A disappointment. 
A letter of complaint from a dissatisfied customer. 12th of April, 2002. Mr. Ernest Blake, Chief Executive, Furniture by Design, 10, Greenwood, London, WC2H8TJ. Dear Mr. Blake, I am writing to complain in the strongest possible terms about the non-arrival of the two sofa beds which I ordered from your firm. Your extensive advertising material stated quite clearly that all orders received by the middle of November would be processed before Christmas. I had several guests over the Christmas period and the non-arrival of the sofa beds left me high and dry with nowhere for the guests to sleep. I'm writing to you personally because I've failed to make any progress with this complaint with any of the employees of your company. Immediately after Christmas, I began to go through the proper channels by contacting your so-called customer helpline, only to find that the line seemed to be permanently engaged. Presumably, this was the result of many other customers being in the same boat as I was. I thought that it was a step in the right direction when I finally did get through, but I could not have been more wrong. The young woman who answered the phone listened to my complaint politely and then said that the person who could deal with my complaint was away from his desk, temporarily, but she would get him to phone me as soon as he returned. Having waited several hours for this phone call, which never came, I once again called the helpline, but it was the same story as before. The line was engaged for hours and, when I did eventually get through, I was told that the person who could deal with my complaint was not available. This time, I asked for this person's name and phoned him back only to discover it was his day off. I spent several days going from pillar to post without getting an explanation or an apology for the non-arrival of the sofa beds. You are the chief executive of the company and the buck stops there. I have left no stone unturned in my attempts to find out what has happened to the furniture and when it will arrive. I am now seeking an explanation from you. If your pre-Christmas advertisements were, in fact, just pie in the sky, then please have the honesty to say so and refund my money. Your sincerely, Marjorie Wood, Mrs. A Letter of Apology A Chief Executive Replies to a Letter of Complaint Dear Mrs. Wood, I was extremely concerned to receive your letter dated 12th of April. Please accept my profuse apologies for the inconvenience which you experienced in connection with the late arrival of the furniture which you ordered from us. I understand that the sofa beds were delivered to you yesterday safe and sound. I have investigated this matter thoroughly, and it appears that our advertising campaign was successful beyond any of our expectations. Our entire range of furniture, and especially the sofa beds, sold like hot cakes. This meant that, to some extent, we were the victims of our own success. We simply did not have enough stock in our warehouses to meet the extraordinary demand. We had been prepared for the race against time to get all the orders fulfilled before Christmas, but not with the lack of product. This would not normally be a problem, as we deal with extremely efficient and speedy suppliers. Usually, they are second to none in their reliability. However, it appears that they experienced a slight technical hitch in their new computerized production process and were unable to supply us with as much furniture as we required. 
their maintenance people had their work cut out to get their production line functioning again in time for the Christmas rush, and valuable time was lost. We searched around for another supplier to help us out, but to no purpose. Being unwilling to accept goods of a lesser quality, we had no choice but to wait for our usual supplier to get their machinery fixed. When all is said and done, quality is what matters to most of our customers. I was sorry to hear that you had such problems with our complaints procedure. I have discovered that these were due to a serious reduction in the number of our helpline staff available then, uh, owing to a local flu epidemic. I'm sorry that this has been such a chapter of accidents. As I have indicated, most of it was a result of circumstances beyond our control. Once again, my apologies for the inconvenience caused to you. We value your custom greatly and hope that you will go on being a client of the company. Yours sincerely, Ernest Blake, Chief Executive. A Lucky Escape A report of an accident in a local paper. Several people had a lucky escape yesterday while waiting for a bus at the corner of King Street and George Street. Some scaffolding fell from a building and landed just behind them. Fortunately, no one was injured because there is a stretch of grass around the front of the building and most of the scaffolding landed on it. The bits of scaffolding landed too close for comfort, said 66-year-old Bert Thompson. It's a miracle no one was hurt, but we were all in shock. You don't expect to dice with death when you're waiting for a bus. I hope the town council are going to do something about this. I absolutely agree, said 56-year-old Margaret Simpson. None of us got hit by the scaffolding. But the fact of the matter is that it was a very narrow squeak, and I'll be contacting the council. They shouldn't allow dangerous things like that on buildings. It wasn't even windy when the stuff fell down. Make no mistake, if the council don't do something soon, It'll happen again, and other people might not be so lucky. A council representative said later, We're all very sorry to hear of this unfortunate accident, but it's not the fault of the council. Responsibility for maintaining such scaffolding rests fair and square with the contractor who erected it. Anyone who is concerned about this incident should contact the contractor directly. Later in the day, some local residents who live in the vicinity of the building in question contacted us to give their views. This was an accident waiting to happen, said their spokesperson, 50-year-old Tom Scott. It has been a bone of contention between the council and ourselves for quite some time. The scaffolding is in a poor state of repair, and no one has worked on the building for several weeks. Not only did we think it was potentially dangerous, but it's a real blot on the landscape. They should be made to finish the work and take the scaffolding down. At the end of the day, the council have a moral responsibility to keep the town safe for their residents. As far as people in this area are concerned, the council must carry the can. They've been putting the whole issue on the back burner for too long. A Day of Misfortunes a letter recounting events and experiences on the day. 
Dear Jenny, it was great to get your letter. You sound as if you're really enjoying college and I can't wait to join you. I'm beginning to wish that I had turned a deaf ear to my dad's suggestion that I spend a year getting some work experience before going to college. I've just got back from work and I've had a really bad hair day. For starters, I got up late. I must have switched off my alarm clock when it went off and I didn't wake up till an hour later. Panic stations! Instead of having a leisurely bath, washing my hair, choosing my clothes carefully and having a nourishing breakfast, I climbed into yesterday's clothes, grabbed a couple of biscuits and headed for the door. I could still have caught a bus that would get me to work on time, but as luck would have it, I saw old Mrs Smart next door struggling to put her rubbish bin out on the street. I stopped to help her and got to the bus stop just as the bus had left. There was no possibility of taking a taxi because I'm on my beam ends until payday next week. I seriously thought of calling the office to say I was sick, but I decided to go in and face the music. When I got to the office, I waited until I thought the coast was clear and hurried past reception without being seen by any of the bosses. Hooray! I said to myself, I've got away with it. I spoke too soon. When I got to my desk, there was my supervisor, Mrs Mason. At long last, she said sarcastically, you've decided to favour us with your presence. My office, now. By this time, I had a very bad headache and was badly in need of a cup of coffee. Instead, I had to listen while Mrs Mason read me the riot act. From what she said, I'm completely useless and totally unreliable. It didn't do much for my morale. The thing is, that was so unfair. I work hard for very little money and I'm hardly ever late. Naturally, I didn't say this to Mrs Smart. Sorry, this is such a moaning letter, but I badly need somebody to grumble to. I'll write a more cheerful one soon. Love, Linda. Goodbye and hello. A managing director's address to the staff. I have called you together today for two reasons. One sad and one happy. The sad reason is that Jack Jones, our marketing director, is off to pastures new and we are here to say goodbye and to wish him well. The happy reason is that we are here to welcome Jim White, who is taking over Jack's position in the company. I know that each and every one of you will be aware of how much work Jack has put into the development of this company. He joined us when we were still a very young company, and his efforts have helped us to become the profitable, successful company which we are today. In addition, I am aware that most of you have found him a pleasure to work with. It's rare for someone not to get along with Jack. Of course, the board of directors and I are sorry that he's going, but we quite appreciate that after all these years, Jack wanted a change of scene. There was a time, not so long ago, when people stayed with the same company from the cradle to the grave. But things have changed. People now move on. In Jack's case, he's moving on to a much larger company, which is very much at the cutting edge of the business. They were impressed with Jack's talents and made him an offer which he could not refuse. People of Jack's skills are few and far between, but we have been very fortunate in securing the services of Jim White, who will, I am sure, prove a worthy successor to Jack. He has certainly been extremely proactive in the company which he has just left, and it's obvious that they are sorry to lose him. I am sure that he will soon find his feet here. Refreshments have been provided in the form of wine and canapé, and I suspect that some of you can't wait to get started on them. Without more ado, then, I shall, on your behalf, 
say an official goodbye to Jack and an official hello to Jim. Jack, I have pleasure in presenting this carriage clock to you as a token of our appreciation. And, of course, it comes with our best wishes for the future. Jim, I have equal pleasure in saying to you, welcome aboard. Bridge Delay A radio interview with a Member of Parliament Mr Jones, I am sure that you are aware that commuters in the area are growing very concerned about the delay in opening the new bridge across the Brunton. It is already nearly a year overdue. The ferry service has been greatly reduced in anticipation of this opening and people have been greatly inconvenienced. They say that they are tired of being promised jam tomorrow and want to be given a definite opening date. Are you able to supply this? Unfortunately, I am not in a position to do so at this moment in time. What I can tell you is that a committee has been set up to investigate the delay and that this committee will report to us in due course. At this juncture, we can say that there have been a number of unexpected teething troubles, but we are unaware of the exact nature of these. Of course, we very much regret the delay and the position which commuters now find themselves in. Meanwhile, Mr Jones, people are having to drive miles to get to work because they cannot get across the river. It appears that the ferry companies jumped the gun when they so drastically reduced the service across the river. The ferry company's decision was a commercial one and is in no way the responsibility of the government or indeed of the local authority. Far be it from me either to criticise or defend their decision, uh, but business is business and presumably they wish to avoid substantial losses by providing too many ferry boats for the numbers using them. It's easy to be wise after the event, uh, but their decision was made as a result of the original building forecast. In view of the inconvenience caused to the public, is it not possible for the government to intervene to try to persuade the ferry company to reintroduce their original service temporarily until the bridge is actually opened? We will give this our earnest consideration, but not until we've had the report of the committee, which is investigating the state of play on the building of the bridge. In the meantime, I must urge everyone to be patient. The splendid new bridge will mark the beginning of a new era for our area, and I can assure you that it will be worth waiting for. A birthday party. An account of pre-party events. It was Julie's 18th birthday and her parents were holding a formal party to celebrate this red-letter day in their daughter's life. In fact, the day after the party was also going to be a red-letter day, not only for Julie, but also for many of her friends who would be at the party. That was the day the results of the final school exams were due to be announced, the moment of truth when some careers would be begun and others abandoned. Perhaps it was not the best time to hold a party, but Julie had wanted to celebrate her birthday on the actual day, rather than postpone it until after the results were announced. Most of Julie's student friends were glad to have something pleasant to do while they waited for the announcement, which, as their English teacher said, would separate the sheep from the goats. Besides, after the results were known, not everyone would have something to celebrate. Tonight, 
Everyone was determined to forget about the results, let their hair down and have a good time, no matter what news the following day brought. As Tom said, Eat, drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. The students had been studying very hard for weeks before the exams and there had not been time for much of a social whirl. Tonight they planned to make up for lost time. Julie's parents were quite well off and could afford to host a good party. There was to be a lavish buffet, champagne and a band to dance to. No expense had been spared. It was not long until the start of the party and several of the girls had gathered at Julie's house so that they could enjoy the fun of getting ready together. They were all planning to get dressed up to the nines and so getting ready took a considerable time. Just as they had all finally finished, the doorbell rang and Mike, Julie's escort for the evening, appeared. Your chariot awaits, he cried, before telling Julie how beautiful she looked and that she would certainly be the belle of the ball. The other girls' escorts soon joined Mike and everyone went off in taxis to the party, but not before Julie's father had a cautionary word for them. Have a wonderful time, but don't forget that Big Brother will be watching you. No one was quite sure whether he was joking or not. Reluctant Attendance An Account of Pre-Meeting Anxieties Mr James was on his way to a meeting in the town hall and he was not looking forward to it. The meeting had been called by the parents of some of the children in the town to complain about the lack of playground facilities in the area. Unfortunately for Mr James, he was the councillor who had responsibility for recreation. Otherwise, wild horses would not drag him to such a meeting. He was hoping against hope that it would be a short meeting and that he could join his wife at the party which was being held at the golf club later in the evening. It was useful to show one's face at such events and as an estate agent he sometimes picked up some useful business. Mr James would far rather be there than at the meeting. However, he had a sinking feeling that the meeting would drag on and that he would not be at the party. Very likely there would be quite a few parents in attendance and he doubted that he would be able to get rid of them very quickly. Some of the people who came to such meetings were intimidated by the fact that they were in the company of a big noise from the council and could be sent away with a few empty promises. That would not be the case tonight. He had already met some of the parents and quite a few of them had the gift of the gab and would not be content with a few excuses. Usually, Mr James would have laid the responsibility for going to this meeting at the door of his deputy, Mr Sharp. But he had said that he was attending an important family gathering, which had been arranged months ago, and was unable to attend. Mr Sharp was a fairly truthful person, but on this occasion, Mr James had a feeling that he was being economical with the truth. Meeting angry parents was no picnic, and all of the other councillors had claimed to be otherwise engaged when Mr James raised the subject. This was a great pity, as there was always safety in numbers at such meetings. If you were unable to come up with a convincing answer, then you could always pass it on to one of your colleagues, at least until you could think of something to say. Facing Angry Parents An account of unpleasant confrontation at a meeting The local town hall 
was full of angry parents awaiting the arrival of Mr. James, councillor in charge of recreational facilities in the town. They had hoped that some of the other councillors would appear, but Mr. James arrived on his own, other councillors being conspicuous by their absence. They were concerned about the lack of playground facilities in the town and were determined that something be done about this. Mr. James was famous for his smooth talking, but the parents were determined that he would not get away with eloquence tonight. Tonight they would make the point that actions speak louder than words. As the parents expected, Mr. James immediately went on the charm offensive when he entered the hall. True to form, he had prepared a speech which said how much the children of the town meant to all the councillors and how concerned the councillors were about the welfare of the young, and he began to read from this. To his surprise, he had hardly got into his stride when he was interrupted by a man who suggested that he cut the cackle and get down to brass tacks. Mr. James was appalled at the man's rudeness, but the other parents were on the side of the interrupter. They were already up in arms about the lack of action on the part of the council, and Mr. James's smooth talking was simply adding fuel to the flames. Mr. James had suspected that the parents would be a difficult audience to please but he was getting more than he had bargained for. Many of them had spent several years trying to get the provision of playground facilities improved and increased, and they were quite determined to get their impatience and dissatisfaction off their chest. Mr. James tried to point out that some improvements had been made in that existing equipment had been repaired. However, this was simply dismissed by the parents as too little too late. Mr. James was absolutely exhausted by the time the parents had finished telling him exactly what was required if their children were to have safe and interesting places to play. He made a great many notes and he also made a mental note not to attend the next meeting on this subject. He would send his deputy. A sudden decision. A conversation about an unexpected career move. Have you any idea why Tom has left his job? Fred asked Andy. Your guess is as good as mine, replied Andy. I did hear that he was under a cloud when he left, but I think that it was a rumour started by Jenny one of his workmates, who doesn't like him. Tom has always been very hard-working and competent. I don't think he was dismissed. Whatever the reason, his resignation was a bolt from the blue. Everyone was surprised. Then Joan joined in the conversation, saying, He might have been bored. I would be climbing the walls if I had to sit in an office all day. Quite the reverse, replied Andy. Tom had a very interesting job, and he loved it. He also liked his boss and the people he worked with. I wonder if it's a case of chercher la femme, said Mary. My brother introduced Tom to an Australian girl called Mel a few weeks ago, and they seemed to get on very well. I think my brother said that Tom and she had been out together quite a few times but Mel is due to go back home fairly soon. Who knows, perhaps Tom's decided on a life down under. It's interesting that you should say that because Tom was talking about Australia just last week, but I didn't realise he had a new girlfriend. He never mentioned her, said Andy. Still, we all know that Tom tends to be rather secretive and never talks about his affairs of the heart. The plot thickens, cried Sarah. Tom was just talking the other day about doing some travelling, but I thought he was just talking about his usual two weeks in Europe. 
It never occurred to me that he was talking about the other side of the world. Well, there's no use in speculating, said Andy. We'll just have to wait and see. I expect that Tom will tell us about his plans when he's ready to. Suddenly, Tom appeared, saying, My ears are burning. What have you all been saying about me? He laughed when he was told about their guesswork. You have colourful imaginations, he said. The truth is much less exciting than what you've come up with. I left my job to go back to university to do a further degree. I'm going back to the groves of academe. More break-ins A report of robberies in a local newspaper. Once again, there has been a series of robberies in the town. This week, several homes have been broken into in Robertson Street, and residents are both worried and angry. Something must be done about this now, said 58-year-old Jack Clements. It's time the police got their finger out and caught these villains. A lot of elderly people live around here, and they're terrified. A police spokesman told us, We are doing all in our power to catch the people who are responsible for these burglaries. The police are stretched to breaking point in this town. Because of budgetary requirements, we have made drastic reductions in the number of police officers on the beat, and this at a time when we are faced with a rising tide of crime, especially among young people. Said Dick Rogers, 64, another resident of Robertson Street, the government should put its money where its mouth is. They're always going on about the importance of law and order, but we still don't have nearly enough police. We used to have a police force that was in a class by itself, but now we hear of nothing but cutbacks. Mary Roberts, 67, also a resident of Robertson Street, said, It's a sign of the times that these crimes are being committed by young people. It's just part and parcel of their general attitude. They are no longer afraid of anyone in authority and have no respect for other people or their property. If we catch any of them around here breaking into houses, we'll give them what for, I promise you. Inspector James Rowland sympathised with the concern of the Robertson Street residents, but urged them not to take the law into their own hands. If you do see someone breaking in, get in touch with us immediately. Don't be tempted to have a go, or you could end up being badly injured. We have a lot of officers working on these burglaries at the moment, but up till now... We have not made any arrests. We are, however, following up a few lines of inquiry. Although we are obviously not in a position at this stage to name names. Meanwhile, we would ask all members of the public to be vigilant and to report anything suspicious to the police. Obituary A Biographical Sketch of a Local Personality The whole community has been saddened by the news of the death of Brian Peterson, who died suddenly last week after a short illness. Brian was well known to many of us in the town, but he was particularly well known in climbing circles and was regarded locally as the grand old man of rock climbing. As a young man, he took part in several major and indeed dangerous climbing expeditions and cheated death on more than one occasion. He regarded it as a real feather in his cap that he was asked to take part in an Everest expedition in 1976 
and welcomed the opportunity with open arms. The expedition was one of the major achievements of his climbing career and provided him with many anecdotes, to which we all listened spellbound. A photograph of the expedition had pride of place on his mantelpiece. Brian will also be remembered as a wonderful speaker and writer. He wrote many articles on climbing for a wide range of publications, but sadly never got round to writing any books on the subject, although this was always his intention. This is a great loss, as he was both an informative and an entertaining writer. However, who can blame him for wanting to spend time on the hills rather than spend it behind a typewriter? Brian was a gifted writer, but it was as a speaker that he really came into his own. Whatever the nature of the audience, he made the subject of climbing come alive for them, illustrating his talks not only with marvellous slides, but also with personal anecdotes. He could hold any audience in the palm of his hand. Sometimes they would be on the edge of their seats at his stories, and sometimes they would be rolling in the aisles. Not surprisingly, he was never short of speaking engagements. Brian was an extremely active member of the local mountain rescue team until his illness. Although always willing to give a helping hand to people who got into difficulties in the mountains, he often got extremely angry with people who ventured onto the mountains without appropriate clothing or equipment and without leaving exact details of where they were going. Brian was a devoted family man and is survived by his wife, Susan, and his sons, Michael and Graham, both of whom are experienced climbers and members of the mountain rescue team. We extend our sympathy to them. Going on a diet A letter recounting reasons for and experiences of dieting. Dear Pam, you know how I said that I was never again going to go on a diet? Well, I take it all back. Here I am again, counting calories and eating little more than lettuce leaves. It's all Polly's fault. She's getting married in July and she's asked yours truly to be her bridesmaid. That's very nice, of course, especially since the wedding's going to be in New York. The fly in the ointment, from my point of view, is that Polly is so slim. Not only that, but the other bridesmaid is Polly's sister, Jane, who is just as slim. However much I try to slim, I'm going to look like the back end of a bus beside them, but I feel I have to try. My mother's not helping because she keeps worrying about my becoming anorexic, as if, and telling me that I'm looking far too pale. As if this wasn't bad enough, my grand's visiting us just now, and my grand's cooking is to die for. I've had to take to eating on my own and cooking for myself. I just cannot bear to have to watch the rest of the family tucking into grand's homemade pies while I am toying with a little steamed broccoli. If I did all, my diet plans would go out the window. So, life's not exactly a bowl of cherries at the moment. I have to get up with the lark so I can have my meagre breakfast before Gran appears to start cooking bacon and sausages or making pancakes. My mother tries to stop her because she's worried about Dad's cholesterol. But for Gran, that kind of cooking is the habit of a lifetime and she just ignores Mum's advice. Naturally, my father and brother love these huge breakfasts. So would I. I take a packed lunch, salad and a bottle of water and eat in the park 
if it's not pouring with rain. The rest of the office are getting very suspicious, and apparently some of them think that I have a new man in my life, and I'm rushing out to meet him. I wish. I'm sorry if this letter is all about food. That's because I rarely think of anything else these days. I find myself thinking that I could murder a steak, when usually I really eat red meat. Much love, Alice. A change of plan. A letter explaining the postponement of a visit. Dear Stan, I'm sorry, my plans to come and visit you next weekend have gone pear-shaped. I was really looking forward to seeing you and to having some fun in the big city. Life here can get boring with so many of my friends away at college. Unfortunately, two things have happened to make me change my plans. We're really under the cosh at work just now. It's coming up to the end of the tax year, and like all accountants, we're up to our ears. To try and cope with the workload, the boss has asked us if we could all work overtime this weekend. As usual, I'm on my uppers, and could really use the extra cash. Also, I'd like to help the boss out if I can. He's a decent bloke, and he's always played very fair with me. It would be difficult to refuse to work when everyone else is going to. Then there's a problem with my grandfather. He's not getting any younger, and he's been a bit under the weather recently. Mum was worried about him, and so he's come to visit for a while. Truth to tell, he's not really recovered from my grandmother's death last year. My mother doesn't like leaving him alone in the house. And she's agreed to babysit for my sister on Saturday night. Dad's away at a conference that weekend, and so it's down to me. So there it is. What with one thing and another, this weekend is not possible, and it would be best from my point of view to leave coming up until some other weekend. Looking on the bright side, I can see that the delay will mean I have more money to spend. When I do finally get there, thanks to the overtime, I hope all's well with you. Drop me a note and let me know if there's any weekend that's not suitable for me to come up, or if there's any weekend that's especially suitable. I would give you the news from home, but there isn't any, or if there is, I'm working so hard that I haven't heard about it. Sorry again about the change of plan. I hope it hasn't messed up any of your arrangements. I'll think of you living it up in the bright lights while I'm watching the telly with Grandad. Cheers, Jeff.